Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Israel Bacchus of Arcane Design Company. Since the first time Israel came on the show, I've had a chance to add his Antimatter Flipper, a collaboration with Something Obscene Company, to my collection of folders. The Antimatter is one of the very few true folding daggers on the market, with perfect symmetry on the show side and a double-edged blade. That's right, double-edged. About a month back, I had the honor of meeting Israel in person at Blade Show 2021 and had a chance to fondle and flip his other designs, the Necronaut with its audacious Tanto blade, and his newest knife, the Crawler, which sold out in less than two hours just a few weeks back when it dropped. I love his knives, and I'm especially interested in unpacking the eerie inspirations behind them. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and click the notification bell. And while you're there, check out my knife close-up videos, Thursday Night Knives, which is our live stream, live stream every Thursday night, and the other interviews with great makers and personalities that make this whole knife world happen. If you think what we do here is valuable and you wanna help support the show while enjoying exclusive opportunities and content, you can do so on Patreon. The quickest way to get there is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Today's podcast is brought to you in part by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, that's www.audibletrial.com forward slash knife junkie. Israel, welcome back to the show. How you doing? Hey, Bob. It's great to be back with you, man. How's it going? Uh, it's going great. It's going great. I want to, uh, before we get the ball rolling, uh, I want to congratulate you on your epic sale of uh, of the crawler. I guess it was, uh, I was looking at my Instagram feed. It was June 11th, I believe. You dropped yeah. that knife and man, it just like hotcakes, it sold. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was really fortunate. Um, Usually what happens with, with my drops, and I've only done about four of them. I'll be on my fourth one pretty soon here, so I'm fairly new. But uh, usually I give the opportunity for the pre-order so that we can like create the funds in order to go into production. And then I close the pre-order off. Uh, and then whatever remaining inventory I have, I drop. And so that's what you were kind of seeing as is uh, all of the other ones kind of going out into the wild. And it was uh, just a super humbling experience. It's awesome that uh, I'm, you know, hopefully creating things that people are interested in. So that pre-order uh, situation is actually even more, um, now that I think about it, it's even more impressive that you sold all, all the pre-order knives because those don't even exist, really. They're going on yeah. faith. Yeah, well, you know, I think... The knife industry, and everyone will tell you this, you know, and I'm sure you already know, the knife industry is one that is really puts trust and faith into makers and people who they want to back. And uh, it's it's like an industry no other. So, you know, I always correlate it to if I were to tell you, you know, that I have a product that it's going to cost $300 or $350 and it doesn't exist yet and you've only seen drawings of it. And if you give me all that money in three to five months, you'll get it in hand. I'm a new person. That's my pitch. Yeah. Like in no other industry do I think that would even remotely like work because people, yeah. you know, um, people want to see a track record. They want to see uh, success. They want to see an actual business structure that is formidable. And uh, but the knife, the knife industry is one where people really cheer um, they cheer the underdog, they cheer companies and brands that are large, but are doing innovative, creative things. Uh, they're willing to extend faith uh, in, in crazy ways. And I can only attribute any sort of success that Arcane has had just due to the fact that this community is like no other. And uh, they're putting faith in me consistently and we're dropping products that people want. So. Uh, I think one one reason that it works well in the in the knife world, different from 
say the grill world. No one buys a grill like that, you know. Like I'm gonna yeah, I'm yeah. gonna want to cook up some meat in six months. Um, and, and it's because knives are such an aesthetically uh, we have such an attachment to how they how they totally. look and and how that look kind of resonates with us. And you get one arcane knife in hand, and then you realize, okay, these are solid productions. Therefore, totally. if I li if I like the design, I'm in good hands. Yeah, yeah. At first, when you said grills, I thought you were talking about like the diamond teeth things that you put in. I was like, yeah, that I guess too. people don't pre-order those. <laughs> I didn't know you were into the grill game, Bob. That's insane. Um, yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Like, people want to know that the product is quality, and I think that's for such a small company and an individual that's doing this uh, from the ground up. It's really nice to know that, like. The first launch was a success. The build quality was there. People were excited about the design and that garnered more faith for me to do a bigger launch next time. And that garnered more faith to do a bigger launch next time because more product was out there with my name on it or with Arcane Design on it. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's this kind of snowball effect that I'm really excited to be a part of. And obviously, you know, it, it doesn't turn out that way um, for, a, a number of people that tried and you know who's to say that you know every every dog has its day kind of thing and i'm really happy and excited that you know arcane design for the last year and a half is slowly but surely growing the following we're getting uh knives in the products of people uh, the knife and the products in people's hands yeah. uh, and it's really fun also just to see knives being sold on the aftermarket you know because obviously mm -hmm. like that's that's what our that's what our industry does. When you're you have a knife, you want the next best thing. You put it on of the Reddit forum, or you put it on Instagram, or whatever. And it's cool to see that people are excited about picking my products up. Uh, not even on the first run, but the the second run or so. So, oh, that's yeah. got to that's got to be a great ego stroke to see um, <laughs> to see a knife you know that sells for a, a pretty nice sum initially go back out and, and yeah, if it's somewhat limited, you know. Totally, totally. Yeah. So, how how did you do it the first time uh, with the um, with the Necronaut? That's the Tanto I was talking about up front. I mean, how how did you convince people before they had a chance to check it out? Yeah, it was that one was such a learning curve and experience because I had never done product design before. I've never I never had experience running my own business. You know, I'd only seen people like something, seen company or uh, Adam Purvis from A Purvis Blades or like people kind of doing these designs that they were getting their designs OEM manufactured. And uh, so I didn't really have, didn't know what to expect going in there. I was thinking, okay, I have this design. I definitely don't have the capital in order to create it on my own, uh, like just initially. And also, if I create, you know, hundreds of them, nobody knows who I am. So how am I going to sell hundreds of them? And so, you know, I think that the next best thing, there's there's always a, a pro and a con to any situation that you find yourself in. Uh, and the pro with um, pre-orders is the fact that you get to first find out if your customer base is interested in something. So you have like data research that you can see the engagement on Instagram for pictures is really high on this drawing mm -hmm. or sending out to reviewers and, and seeing people sign up for your newsletter and like a big boost of, of people doing that. So you can kind of gauge and understand like, am I putting out what people want or do I think that this design is sick and that it turns out like, two people like it and it's like well that didn't work you know and then now i'm stuck with hundreds of knives not knowing what to do with and so a pre-order obviously gives you that data that you know what you're working with you know or have some idea of like what you would be able to actually place in the market uh, and it also like provides the capital um, when it comes to the pre-order process the people who are like believing in the knife are truly the ones getting it produced you know, it's it's not me. I can do as much as I can on my end as far as making the design clear and crisp and even and, you know, doing as much as I can on my end. But the knives won't pr be produced unless the small, mighty 
people who, again, have faith in the product and the design actually show up and are there. And uh, so that's what's great about pre-orders, but also the downside of pre-orders is that people wait for three to five months, depending on the, pro- the depending on the design or the product or who what OEM manufacturer using. So that's the tough part because you're ha- you're playing this waiting game, and especially from somebody who wants to be involved as much as possible in the process. You know, I can tweak a design and get it perfect and get the geometry exactly how I want and get everything perfect. But at the end of the day, as you can tell by I'm, I'm in my garage and it's basically the size of what you see, I don't ha- I can't produce anything. And so I have to have faith and give it over to the OEM manufacturer to do it. And so the waiting time, as brutal as it is for people waiting for their knife that they've already paid for, it's brutal for me because I it's it's my baby. You know, that design yeah. is what I want to bring into the world. And it's so hard to kind of give that off to a company and luckily i've chosen um manufacturers that have been awesome and have continued to create um bring my uh knife designs to life in a way that i'm happy with the quality uh and everybody else is so when my first design uh the necronaut i first was like well i don't know how to raise capital i don't know how to do pre-orders but i know about kickstarter so i'll do kickstarter Mm -hmm. and i did kickstarter and Kickstarter is a whole another animal. Have you ever purchased anything off of Kickstarter? I have not personally. Dude, guy, a, a guy, it's a whole another process. It's um, like I bought a gift for somebody. Like my, I, I bought a gift for my friend like two years ago, and a product that I've purchased, like I still haven't had. Huh. Uh, and so it's one of those things. It's like. It's just such an interesting thing and it works well with like video games or com- graphic novels or like uh, board games, things like that. But when it comes to the knife industry, I have found that it's not the right tool for the right industry. Now, obviously you can find gadgets and stuff like that on that platform, but it doesn't really cater to the specific niche market of high-end production knives because people who are generally surfing for a, a latest design of a knife aren't necessarily in that same sphere it's just two different spheres that have a little bit of overlap Mm -hmm. but not a lot it's not you're not going to convince the average kickstarter person that your knife design is worth 300 plus dollars or whatever it's just not the same market um there so uh the first one we were about 75 or 80 percent funded and then i we saw like it just completely stagnated and it didn't work out. And that was like a huge learning curve. So the only reason why I wanted to utilize Kickstarter is because I wanted to give people assurance that by them sending their funds to me, like they were going to have some sort of insurance that you know, like Kickstarter would cover their funds, would refund them if it didn't work out. Like I, I was trying to place myself in the position of like a, a, a knife person and like, Hmm. I don't know this company, but they're utilizing Kickstarter. So maybe that'll, that'll like push it over the edge for them to jump into the design. So that, that failed off the onset. And so that was like, obviously a setback uh, that I was prepared for. Cause again, I was new. I was like, every, either it's going to work or it's not going to work. And we're going to find out what does. And so uh, I did a lot of like research. Like, yeah, I love listening to my customer base because obviously they're the ones that I'm trying to cater to. And they're the people that, you know, are the bread and butter of arcane design. And so I, I sent out surveys. I said, you know, was it the price point that wasn't correct? Was it the platform that wasn't correct? Was it, was it the design that you didn't like? So I did a lot of research with people. Um, and that was so, so helpful to reach out to the, to reach out to that customer base and understand, you know, what you needed or what was needed in order for it to be successful. And uh, eventually we launched it on my own website, jumped in, had full faith that that would work and it got 100% fully funded. So well, um, what, what was the answer? You sent out the survey. What, what, how were people responding from the Kickstarter? Yeah, it was... Yeah, uh, a lot of people, you know, I first, so so Kickstarter, 
because it is a plat like a tertiary platform that you're utilizing, you know, they charge a premium, they charge a certain percent and then charge like uh, handling fees and they charge a lot of like other fees that in order for us to break even with the knife, again, I was doing this as a passion project. So I was like, hey, I just want to break even. I don't care. You know, right. like in order to do that, the price point on that initial knife was a little too high for what people were wanting to pay for a brand new company. Gotcha. You know, so it was one of those like, so, so I asked, like, was well, it the price point? Was it the design? If I were to relaunch this pre-order, do you care if it's on Kickstarter or not? And I found the vast majority of people were like, don't care if it's on Kickstarter. So by knowing that, I was able to just take it off that platform, lower the price uh, in order for it to be comparable to what people wanted to pay. Um, and it, it was just so, so helpful to like learn that stuff, but you're not, you're never going to learn anything if you have like Obviously, you can learn things by having success after success after success, but there's something about that failure that really instills it instills so many like new nuggets of information that I'm able to like pass that off to people. I have a, a handful of people that have reached out to me saying like, I, I have designs, I want to do this. I'm thinking about, you know, uh, utilizing Kickstarter, and I'm able to share my experience with that and the experience of that the experiences that I've had within failure to help people out in the community and to just give me a better understanding of how I can best serve the customer in the market. So. Uh, as a, as a knife buyer and collector and, you know, uh, I, I think, I think there are a lot of different ways to justify the sort of money and attention and time we spend right. uh, in this hobby. Um, one thing I find in myself is, a little impatience sometimes, especially mm. if it's a design that I'm just, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Sometimes there's a design. This was actually one of them. The antimatter was one of them. I just had to have this knife. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but I, I get impatient and, um, and also sometimes uh, this isn't so much with me. I, if I latch onto a design that I love, that's kind of it until I have it. But uh, do you find that trends change in the short or, or in the longish period of time it takes for you to go from design through the OEM and out on the other side with a product? And that's a, that's a really, really great point. Um, I would say that I think it, I think it depends. I think a lot of like bigger companies, they need to go with trends or oftentimes they're trendsetters or, you know, certain things like that, that really like drive the market are the trends. And that makes sense for their business structure. People who are coming to Arcane Design, you know, obviously like, like trends and they like the latest and greatest things, but they're initially coming because of the type of aesthetic that we're going for or the type of knife um, design that we're going for. So I think that's, that might be, an issue for some companies as far as like the production time and like if I design something will it be obsolete mm -hmm. um, luckily I don't think that's I don't think it's enough time the three to five months or so or even like the start of designing a knife to it actually being in creation could any be, be anywhere between eight months to a year or so I think the people that I truly have the opportunity of serving and, and selling knives to um, gravitate to my knives more than just what is, uh, what is popular or the new trend. Um, and so I think because it's such a small niche, uh, brand and the things that we're doing as far as like different aesthetics and having different themes and, and things like that, uh, it doesn't play a huge factor. Uh, now, if I had foresight and I could crank a knife out within a month and let's say the new thing is some crazy back flipper with I, who knows a yo-yo attached to it or whatever, like <laughs> I, I have the possibility of like cranking something out like that. Um, but luckily, I haven't seen that as an issue. Um, 
I think, again, it's it, that might be an issue for larger companies who are trying to forecast things right. outwards. And if they create thousands of knives from a style or a trend, it's kind of like I would imagine like the clothing industry, right? It probably goes a little bit slower, yeah. um, but th- they're having to forecast things. And if something is not in trend, they're losing thousands of dollars and have hundreds of knives stored in some warehouse because nobody wants them because I'm doing smaller numbers. I kind of have the guarantee that the knives that I'm creating will sell, uh, which is really fortunate. So, uh, but I, that's, uh, that's a great point. And that's something I really haven't thought about before, as far as like the trends knives are knife trends. They don't move as fast, like, like clothing and stuff, but uh, it's really interesting to see how that goes. I was, uh, you know, I'm in the process of, thinking about uh doing a fixed blade mm. uh and i love large fixed blades i think <laughs> take a look at your your wall i think you will also yeah. <laughs> you do as well yeah. um yeah but uh you know like so i was thinking like yeah i want something maybe four and a half five inches something really rugged and robust and stuff and i was having a conversation with sam edelman of edelman knives and uh he was like dude Three to three and a half inches is where people are at. People used to love the really large fixed blades. Nowadays, like in the last couple of months or so, people are really going for that small EDC package. I thought like, that's really interesting. Like, yeah, I think there will be a point where, you know, I I don't want to, I don't want my company to be on the back end of, what's popular i want to design and create things that are hopefully on the cusp or on the crest of what that is um and luckily i think i've done that to the small audience that i have thus far so we'll see i feel like uh you know, as you know, I, I love fixed blades and I'm, I've, I'm in a fixed yeah. blade stage right now. I come in and out of all these different stages Yeah, and, uh, and right now this is just my opinion about arcane design and fixed blades. I think, I think, uh, Ben was correct in that. Um, I think the trend with fixed blades, the ones that are the most popular right now, if you're not an outdoors company, I mean, arcane mm. doesn't strike me as a camping, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, tactical soldier knife. The two right. the two kinds of fixed blades I see Arcane Design accelerating in are the small three and a half inch that you could actually put in your pocket in some right, cool, right. cool kind of sheath, or the very popular uh, uh, tactical, not even tactical. That's not the right like self defense pick call style. You know, mm. tip down, edge in. Uh, those little. There are a lot of small blades. That yeah. have that have that tip down edge in fighting thing that are yeah. small, small and discreet. That I feel like your design style could. I mean, I, your design style could could do everything from giant fixed blades to small and sure, be very sure. very cool. But in terms of like selling right now, I I could see you doing. I think I think yeah. you could have some great success with either one of those. But when we were talking about trends, it seems like trends in the knife world um, different from fashion. Um, you know, uh, they kind of build on top of one another, you know? Um, Mm. so for a little while, uh, the front flipper was the hot thing and now we see it incorporated in with regular flipper slash thumb stud knives. Uh, and for a while, um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, integral lock, the uh, frame lock was like a new thing. And then, right. and then flippers got brought into it. I mean, of course, at this point, that's 10 years ago, but uh, things seem to kind of like build on top of one another. So right. it's, it's almost hard for me right now to, to think of a, of a really dated blade. You could date it by what was new and hot at the time, but everything kind of seems to build and, and, and continue on, you know, off of one another. Yeah. 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 It's so interesting how like trying to design things uh, and then also, like you said, wanting to be where people are as far as like, oh, they want front flippers or they want natural micarta is a really big thing or like inlays, you know, things like that. There's certain like you will never please everybody. And that is like (laughs) to learning that uh, is really helpful. Um, 
and and I think that's like kind of solidified like well I don't know what everybody wants and I there's no way of me actually like pleasing everybody even if I did know what they wanted so I'm going to do the things that I'm interested and excited about uh, and the things that I think are utilitarian the things that I think are actually useful and fun uh, to have in a pocket knife because let's be honest it's like you want functionality, you want design, language, and aesthetics, and then you also want something that's fun. Like, you you know, you, you it, it's just, it's kind of a, a must if you're, if you're carrying something, you know, of a high-end pocket knife, that's, that's what you're wanting. And so, yeah, it's really, it's really tough to try to balance those things out. Um, but it is so rewarding when you see that what is important to you, you find a market for. Mm-hmm. And other people think that's important as well. What I find really interesting, and it's kind of, I, I, I've seen a couple of like people online and stuff being like, oh man, not another frame lock flipper. Like, in, and I totally get that. Like frame lock flippers came out a while ago. And because the frame lock came out, it was really strong. It was really credible. It was easy um, to handle and maneuver, and and it, it was a it's genius design as far as locking mechanism. I think it's just solid, robust. It gives the most strength for what it is, at for as as simple as possible, yeah. you know, design. Um, and then flippers, like people like oh, and so I think everybody has seen a ton of frame lock flippers. My personal favorite is a frame lock flipper. Like I love that. And I understand people are like, no, it needs my car to, it needs to be a slim front flipper and stuff like that. And it's like, what's really cool about this industry is that if that's what you want, you can yeah. absolutely go find that. Yeah. And that's awesome. And, and Arcane Design, as much as I would love to be, I'm not going to be the company for everybody, yeah. which is crazy for me to think that because if I start doing that, if any knife company starts doing that, they're going to lose their identity. Um, and because we're so so small and we're we're growing, but but it's kind of a, a niche boutique. Boutique's a weird word. It sounds a little different, but more of a niche like design kind of brand. You know, I, I have the control that I want on it, and and realizing that I'm not going to please everybody is kind of a thing that you just have to accept and understand that like. I will find my audience somewhere and I have found my audience somewhere and, and hopefully I'll design something that one of those people who did not like my design initially will, it'll speak to them someday. But for right now, you know, it can't be the case. So. I mean, that's, that's actually has to be a liberating um, realization. It's kind of like being in a relationship with someone and realizing, Hey, you know, they love me for who I am. I don't have to pretend to be this guy or that guy. I'm just going right. to be the goofball I am. And they accept it right. already. Like, and they come to me because they like that aspect. Um, totally. Totally. Uh, well, I think it's, I think it's like, just the last thing on that. It's kind of yeah. like when you're in grade school, like you're, you're, you're new to something and you want people to like you and you want like, and I'm not talking about like personality. Like, obviously I want to be the nicest guy to anybody. And, and, you know, that's a, a huge part of what I want to do in this community uh, is just bring positive positivity to it. Um, but as far as like design or what people are into and things like that, like, you know, when you're younger, you're like people's, what people think about you is kind of everything, you know? And then as you get older, you realize, no, I'm a different, I'm a different flavor for a particular type of people, you know, and I'm okay with that. And I think any company that's jumping into this, you can't please everybody. And so you're going to have to stick to the DNA of why you started this company. So, well, uh, for, I, I want to ask you about blade show, uh, but do you have a crawler close at hand? Yeah, I do. I do. Okay, so, I have... so I had a chance to check out the crawler at blade show. How oh, God, uh, that's a beautiful I knife. Yeah, yeah. This one is the uh, Damas steel Thor pattern one. And then I put the black inlays on it. So people who are listening to the show, it's it's a beautiful Warncliffe design, uh, very robust looking blade. It's actually, as you've uh, told us before, it's the mirror opposite of the Necronaut. Yeah, which is, yeah. Which is a Tanto, you know, just imagine uh, a 
you know, mirroring it on the spine and it's basically the same shape. And, uh, there you go. That's a better yeah. version. There you go. So, uh, how was blade show for you? What it was this your first blade or second? Or <laughs> so this was my first blade, like actually showing, mm -hmm. uh, I went to blade show West and I had like a prototype plastic version of the knife and I walked around to people and I was like, Hey, can you put this in your hands and tell me what you think about it? Like that was my first encounter of blade show West. Um, but this was the first time going into blade show and, um, you hear a ton of people talk about like what blade show is and you're like, okay, it seems like a really interesting experience. You know, I don't really know what to expect. And it truly really is exactly what people say. It is a group of people really excited and enthusiastic about what people are doing in the industry and, and looking for the next knife. And it's definitely, I would say 100% more about the people rather than the product, uh, which again is such a, unique thing in the knife industry and so um blade show was i mean it, it i had a great time i'm sure you had even a better time because i was stuck at my table you actually got to <laughs> yeah. see a ton of cool things right. i think that was mistake number one i just brought myself like i'll have to you know bring some like a, a, a my brother or a friend or something like that in order to help me man the table so i can sneak off and see all the cool things um but i learned a ton uh, I, I learned a ton. I got to meet a lot of people uh, that, you know, I have developed relationships with online. I got to meet a lot of new people and put my products in their hands. Um, and again, you know, the, the, the learning, another learning point about it was you will find your audience. If you have something unique that you're excited about and it speaks to some people, you're going to find your audience and uh, you, you should see some of the people walking by my table were looking like, what on earth is that? That's not a knife. And then kept walking. <laughs> and then some people came and were really excited to check out something that was a little bit different than anything else that they'd seen at the table. And I think that's really cool. Like you're, you're getting to truly test out where you are. Uh, and it, it is kind of, the trial by fire to a certain, that sounds a lot more tense than what it was, but in the same sense, it's kind of a refinement of how you want to portray yourself to the community because you're there right in front of people. You're not, you're not interacting with people through Instagram messenger and emails and things like that. You're having to be there, um, be excited with the customer about what they're excited about. Um, and it's it's so rewarding. I'm I'm definitely a people person, and so you know, really cool people, and they also are into knives. Like I'm gonna be I'm gonna be with it, you know. So yeah. you had a, a you had a really cool tape. You know, um, if you haven't been to Blade Show, this was my first year. If you haven't been to Blade Show, um, there are booths, you know, which are kind of larger setups with with backdrops and um, you know, kind of cases, and uh, and then there are tables. And the tables are smaller setups. You had a setup, you had like a booth setup at a table, I thought. You had those cool light <laughs> boards. And what I thought yeah. was really smart about putting the light boards out is that a lot of, about your designs are their profiles, you know, because right. they have very striking and unique profiles. And and some of them have negative space, like, like this knife has the negative space in the... Uh, uh, you know, in the choil areas and there's negative space it, and, and this symmetry here. And, right. uh, and then of course the negative space on the opening holes on the other knives and totally, and, and the, the designs just jump out at you. I thought that was a really smart way of, uh, of, uh, setting it up. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I, arcane design is is truly I, I want to create a modern design for an ancient tool and I'm wanting to bring as much functionality and quality with the type of you know aesthetic and design that I have and so when it comes to striking and, and aesthetics and things that are pleasing to me as far as design I was wanting to really showcase that and um Luckily, I found this kind of niche and, and design language that really speaks to more futuristic, uh, more science fiction and horror. And I think we're going to kind of dive into yeah. that. But, uh, you know, it, it, it was something that I, I wanted to make sure that 
my presence and interaction, I, I look through, when it comes to customer interaction, I think of everything through the lens of an experience. And I think you and I talked about this when I got my first knife and per, like it came in a, a box full of packing peanuts and it was like a Ziploc bag and I was so underwhelmed. <laughs> and I, I realized how important it is to have an experience uh, with a product or with a company because you're speaking a different language. You're, you're, you're satisfying not only the fact that they know they're going to have a quality product in their hand, but you're also giving them a, an experience. And so with Blade Show, I kind of approached it no differently. And uh, I, I'm glad you kind of noticed. And I know a lot of people were, were saying that the bo light boards and the displays and stuff were pretty cool. And uh, that means a lot because those are the things that I really focus on. Those are the things that I kind of care about or the things that at least draw me in. So yeah. well, your, your designs are um, they're They're twofold in that you look at them and they're very um, unique and they have a futuristic look to them. Um, but then you also see your marketing and I'm thinking of uh, your Instagram posts, which always include um two pictures, you know, or, or more than two pictures, but there's always right. a picture of the knife and then you flip it to the next picture and it's some sort of cosmic shot or some sort of, uh, um, well, let's talk about it. So your, your designs yeah. have a story and they also have a backstory. Uh, where do you get that from? Yeah. Well, like, like you stated, I, I I'm wanting to create more than just a product. I want to create an experience. I think that's what people are kind of excited about, uh, at least when they see some of my designs. You know, my first knife, I thought, you know, what's the best knife to just to survive space? You know, I wanted to design something that was robust, that was futuristic, but still functional and really comfortable in hand. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of had this design language in my head. And I, this sounds ridiculous, but from an early age, I used to draw you know, on napkins or whatever. And if you just handed me, you know, a pencil and paper and say, draw something, you know, some kids would draw a dog or a skateboard or something like that. And I was always drawing geometric shapes. And I didn't even think like that was a big deal or whatever. That was just what I was into as a kid. And I always thought like, that's weird. Like, why am I not drawing balloons like everybody else? You know, I was just kind of drawing weird mountain, sharp glacier edge kind of stuff. And it turns out that that served me really well. And I found this, uh, this little niche thing. And, um, and so I knew that I wanted something in a particular design language from lines and lines and angles and geometry that I found appealing. Um, and because it was so futuristic, I kind of established arcane design is more as more of the on the cusp or on the futuristic side of design, um, because that's what speaks to me. And so when we think of the future, you know, we don't have, we don't know what the future is because nobody knows what the future is, but we have literature and we have films and we have things that kind of convey to us what we want the future to be, or perhaps what we don't want the future to be. And so science fiction is something that I've always gravitated towards. Um, and so, like sci-fi horror and things like that, because you realize that you're in a world that could be great, but always has the same issues or problems or a dystopian type of like feel to it. So there's always problems that are going to be solved even within the future. Like if we saw a movie about the future, a science fiction movie about the future, and everything was fine. Everyone had clean water and free and fresh food. There were no <laughs> wars and there is no crime and everyone was great. Nobody would watch that. Like yeah. the, the, the idea of struggle and challenge, and this is getting way too philosophical. And I know this is a knife podcast, but the no, struggle no. of, I, yeah, the, the idea of, of struggle and uh, persistence is like an archetypal a story that speaks to the human condition. Like there's always something that's going to be fixed. There's always, there's always something that needs to be fixed or needs to be utilized or things to be changed. And so although the future, we think of it as the ideal um, because we think it has so much raw potential in it. Like that's why we have kind of hope for the future a lot of times 
You know, when we think like, oh, the future is going to be more advanced, we're going to have everything because it has the potential. Like we, nobody knows what the future has, but we do know it hasn't messed up yet. So it has potential. That's why we love little kids because they represent potential. They haven't messed up their lives yet. So exactly. Yeah. 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 So that kind of like feeling, realizing that all the stories that I gravitate towards, you know, you're like the future still has things that need to be fixed and seeing a knife as like an ink as a tool um which you know obviously has been used throughout the human existence um it was like that that's going to stay the same like a, a knife is going to still be useful in the future and so when i started arcane design i was thinking well if knives are still going to be useful in the future because problems and issues and situations need to be resolved in the future still why not start designing for that and so that's kind of like where i came from and obviously since you can't see or know the future i started designing things based off of science fiction films that i knew or um ideas and concepts that i was interested in so the necronaut and i know we've talked about it at length but the necronaut needs dead astronaut um, thinking about an astronaut needing to get home, what's the best knife that he can utilize to fix his ship or to fend off intruders or things like that, you know? And obviously, at the end of the day, it's a knife. And I've had a couple of people come to me like, hey, man, you're thinking too much about this. It's a <laughs> knife. Like, people are either going to use it to cut boxes or not. But if we're, if we're investing so much money and energy and time into collecting these beautiful pieces of art, if I'm going to design something like that, I'm going to give it more purpose than just that because anybody can buy a knife of, with functionality. Yeah, exactly. And a lot of people do, you know, and all power to them. Again, that's what, what's really cool about the knife industry. You can get the most plain Jane thing you want to, and nobody's going to judge you. You can get the craziest thing you want to, and nobody's going to judge you. And so, but I wanted to design something that was just a, a little bit different with the style that I wanted uh, for the situations that I was thinking of in my head. And so all, all the knives have their own kind of futuristic theme. They have their own somewhat of a backstory because stories convey meaning to us like human beings gravitate towards stories and so i'm wanting to again create more of an experience with the purchase of a product or the use of a product than anything it's like you could be you could have that joyless sort of viewpoint you're looking too much into it you're either going to open a box or not but right. yeah there, there is something that's more um I don't know. I, maybe not to everyone, but I think for everyone, because everyone watches movies, everyone reads books or loves stories. Totally. You know, um, I was thinking about uh, b before we started rolling, I was thinking about, uh, you know, um, you talk about futurism or science fiction horror. And I started thinking about horror and I started thinking about, um, you know, legends and myths. And you live up in the great Northwest. I was thinking about Sasquatch and like, <laughs> yeah, things, yeah, yeah. things we don't know about that sure. lurk right around the corner. And that, that could be the future. That could be a ghost that could be, um, you know, a, a beast that eludes us. But I mean, to, to kind of, um, uh, use that as your, as your design sort of launching pad, I think is, a. I think it's a valuable thing. I think it adds valuable. Uh, it adds value to the design. Yeah. Well, there's something you, you reminded me of uh, something that I heard uh, some, a man talk about of if you are scared and you decide and you tell yourself, all right, I'm going to stick my hand in a completely dark room. You, the imagination of a human who is scared or afraid of something will create so many monsters in his head when he sticks his hand into a box or something that like he doesn't know what's in there and it's complete darkness. And like, that's kind of the, that's kind of an exciting place because although it's fear driven, it, it creates the possibility of imagination of things that could be either terrifying or really cool and really exciting. Uh, and so, yeah, you're right. It's like kind of on the cusp. Another thing that I want to point out, like I'm seeing a lot of beautiful pieces that you have hanging on your wall and like, I think there's a Persian somewhere over there and it, or like, you know, the old historical, uh, not like the his, historical designs. If you see a Persian, for example, you're like, whoa, 
that takes you back to thinking about like uh, the Raiders of the Lost Ark or like somewhere in Saudi Arabia, like a prince, you know, doing something or whatever. And like, that's the reason why people gravitate towards certain designs. I'm coming at it from virtually the same thing, but I'm trying to think about it in the future on the other end. And I think, I think that's, what's been successful at least with arcane design is that people are, understanding what i'm trying to do and not to say that i'm designing anything that nobody's ever seen before i'm not claiming anything like that i'm trying to design things that you you would see in you would find in outer space a hundred years from now and somebody be like interesting that's a really interesting piece that was probably designed five years ago when in fact it was designed you know 40 years ago you know i'm trying to design things and, and create a different aspect of like what people find interesting from the blades and the knives of the past. I'm trying to do that the opposite side within the future. Yeah. And, and when you look at, so I'm look, we're looking right now at the, at the Necronaut, the Tanto and, and uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty straight line from your Tanto to the, to the non-folding non uh, you know, non-dual pointed, you know, the, the old Quaken style tantos. It's like not that much has changed, but enough that, uh, you know, you put your own English on it, of course, but also there is uh, a um, uh, the passing of time evident in it, you know, the mechanism, uh, the the angularity of it or, or, totally. or whatever, but it's still, you know, a samurai would still recognize that. It might take him a second to <laughs> To, oh, it flips open. How cool. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and then from then on, it is a knife. And uh, you know, you know, I was just looking at this at this dagger. I keep I love showing this thing off. I love it. But uh, <laughs> oh, that's great, just, man. Just to look, this is a dagger, you know, and this is uh this is this goes way back to flint napping, or you know, you think of the the guy who had the uh the rapier and the dagger or or what have you, you know, it's just a double-edged knife, uh, knife. But the thing I love about this is you've managed to put a double-edged knife in a modern housing, you know? And like I said, there are right. three that I can think of. I mentioned that last time we spoke. Three of these that I can think of uh, that aren't custom, uh, you know, it's you, Hinderer, yeah. and Sharp by Design. That, right. that, and now I guess Fox Knives made one this year, but. Oh yeah? Yeah, well, yeah. They're, check that out. Yeah, but it's tiny, you know? But I, what I, you, you know, you. it looks cool and I want to check it out for sure. But there are not too many double edged dagger knives out there. But um, totally. yeah, it's, it's that sort of connection to the past as well as uh, your sort of projection into the future. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Bob, I got a question for you. And I'd love because you get to handle and speak to a lot of makers and you get to handle a lot of cool pieces and things like that. And you, what you brought up right now where you're like, well, it's a knife design, but it's a little bit smaller and. And obviously people like big knives, people like small knives. I know you're more of on the big side kind of fan. Mm. What do you think when we're talking about trends and things like that? Like I kind of have an idea of what that looks like, but I'd love to get your perspective on what would you like to see as far as trends or sizes or what do you think people are currently wanting right now from the knife industry? Well, I think those are two different questions. So I'll I'll tell you what I think people are, are wanting from the knife industry. Uh, I think people uh, definitely like some, uh, well, first of all, I'll start off with 3.25 inches. That's like, I think that's the golden uh, blade length that yeah. that is the most universal across. Uh, and and there, there are a few knives where I will tolerate such a size. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> uh, I love the Yojimbo too. And, and, you know, I love the, I love the, um, the Benchmade bug out and there, there's some knives in that, but to me, I like the larger knives and, and I don't sure. think that that's where things are trending. I think things have trended down from there. Um, sure. but I, I think that, uh, people like a really solid build above anything else. And even mm. if it's, even if it's as light as the, um, the bug out, what was the first thing people started doing with the bug out? They started squeezing the scales together. I love it. It's light. It's so useful. The, you know, Benchmade has really brought up their CQ. You know, you were hearing all that stuff, but people kept squeezing the handle, but it's a little, you know, 
It doesn't feel that solid. So people start, the, there was a whole cottage industry of making scales for those. Right. And then Benchmade got the hint and they, I think they have started doing some exclusives in any case, you know, building it up. So I think people want a very solid build. I think if there can be one unique detail about the knife uh people will gravitate towards it yeah um, for instance with the bug out it was the lightness of it uh right but, but in other cases you know people love that front flipper people people love you know a good action um so yeah i think i think a good action 3.25 inches a very solid build and and one unique characteristic about it i think that if i think that if there are too many uh and and i mean that in terms of function not necessarily sure. in terms of aesthetics, because sure. with aesthetics, I think people are a lot more um, accepting or forgiving or excited to see a lot right. of cool flourishes. There are a couple of yeah. knives out there, like like the the Kershaw twenty twenty one line. I guess the most recent line of oh, Kershaw, yeah, yeah. Kershaw knives. Er, almost every knife uh, that I kind of glanced at, to me, I'm like too many notes, one too many special things on it uh, like you yeah. got a weird blade shape and a weird handle shape and you have this inlay and you have this and you have right that. like yeah calm down with it and and uh and i don't know that's maybe that's just my opinion uh, i i i can't second guess kershaw knives they've done pretty well for themselves <laughs> but <laughs> well and the, the reason why i ask is i love hearing what people sorry i'm shaking my table okay. i love hearing what people are into or what they think the knife industry is and it just kind of goes to, to solidify that it's it's a lot of things to all people yeah um and it's it's so exciting that there's room for everything because like you said 3.25 inches it's not my personal favorite you know yeah. i like a little bit of a bigger knife but like talking to the people who are really interested in understanding why they like that or where they're coming from on certain things is where the real excitement is for me because you get to find out what people are interested in and why they like the things that they like. So what do you want to see within the knife industry within the uh, next I'll, couple of years? I'll tell you that in a second, but I neglected two things. Uh, uh, um, one, people like the deep carry. I'm not so married to deep carry, uh, though yeah. I don't like too much sticking out, but deep carry uh, clip. And then the the one that I, I should have probably mentioned up front is thin behind the edge. That's mm. you know, people all of a sudden like knives that cut. And I don't understand that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> but, but you know, real thin behind the edge is, uh, yeah. seems to be something that people really pay a lot of attention to. And there are a lot of ways you can get there, you know, with blade stock thickness, you know, people realizing you don't need a big bruiser uh, blade stock um, yeah. unless, unless you're building a big bruiser knife. And hollow grinding and all, and all that stuff but so oh, what what i would like to see more of uh, frankly are more like four inch blades kind of in the neighborhood of you know they say you maintain the style you had when you were in your 20s all the way through your life so you know if you're <laughs> if, you know it's it's kind of like that for me it's like my thing has always been the larger tactical knives that came from yeah from early cold steels and emersons and stuff like that and that sort of bit has just hung on with me i also yeah. think that that four inch blade shape gives you a slightly more room to truly express the shape whereas mm. uh, when it's a uh, when it's 3.5 inches or lower you're starting to truncate things kind of like a really beautiful car that only has six cylinders so the hood is short yeah. you know, or something yeah. like that um so i would like I to see more of that i i'd like to see uh um uh, different locks it, uh, uh seeing the um the demco knives uh, shark lock was exciting for me yeah um, but at the same time i am also an old-fashioned guy i like just a thumb stud with a nice solid kathunk that opens with that quote-unquote hydraulic feel yeah um, so I guess what I'm saying is take me back to my twenties. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's so funny when you said like, yeah, whatever you had the the fashion or the things that you're into in your twenties, that's what you stick to you for the rest of your life. I realized like, man, that's so true. That's so <laughs> true. And it's, you're like, I am not with the times anymore, especially with fashion and stuff. I'm like, forget it. Yeah. yeah I don't yeah. know what's happening anymore. <laughs> but um, yeah, I I love what you kind of picked on as far as like, you know, the blade chip of a four inch 
being able to express the certain lines. I'm, I'm currently working on a design right now and it's a, uh, it's 3.25. It's my first kind of smaller knife. Um, and you know, I like taller blades, but if you have a really tall blade on a 3.25 inch, it looks like a little stubby thumb. And I was like, wow, I'm having to focus on the width and the height and everything to make sense. And so the things that I appreciate uh, within knives, I'm having to cater and change slightly and modify in order to make things work and happen and, and still feel or look natural. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a huge, everything within knife design, I think a lot of people don't necessarily know this, um, but everything with a knife design is give or take. Um, so like I had to give up certain design things that I love doing because it's a shorter knife or with blade thickness, like you really want a really robust blade and thickness, but depending on the grind, you can't bring the grind super high depending on the shape because your tip is going to be super small. Mm. And so if people are like, well, I want a robust tip, you're like, great. But then that changes the geometry of the actual grind for cutting. And so you're like having to balance a ton of things that you didn't really know about. And so a lot of times people are like, oh, well, I want a thinner grind and I want a, a really robust tip and I want a, a thick blade stock. And you're like, well, you, I find that with knife design stuff, you can only have two of the three things that you want. And like, I'm slowly but surely realizing that a lot of things are a give and take. And so, you know, I have a lot more, I have a lot more um, understanding and patience and, and not, not compassion, but sympathy for knife design or knife makers on certain things. And again, like you can't please everybody. Um, and it's just been so interesting to realize like, man, I wish I could have it all and I can't, or like a certain blade shape. You're like, this would work, work great for, you know, a, a liner lock, but something with the, the lock engagement isn't right. And so you have to give up some sort of design portion of that, or there's just so many things that you kind of have to think about that you didn't even know you had to think about. And that, that carries over into the choice of blade steel. Same thing with blade steel. You can only have two of those three things. You want toughness oh, and edge retention? Well, you're not going to have uh, stain resistance. You want stain resistance and edge retention? Well, it's going to be chippy or it's not going to be tough enough. Right. So, but that's um, that's kind of a, a, a bittersweet and, and beautiful aspect to it, right? Because totally, it's like life. You can't have everything you want, like the Rolling Stone set. You know, you really Gosh. can't have everything that you want. So you're going to have to, you know, take a look and find what is the most, uh, you know, what you actually need and, yeah. uh, and choose from there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Before we wrap up last time we spoke, uh, you were, you were mocking up. Um, I think you were using a 3d printer and you had something mm -hmm. kind of in the recurvy Bowie kind of, uh, uh um, area do you remember Ooh. that i do have i do so maybe, maybe not, i added the recurve in my mind but yeah i do have a bowie yes i do have a bowie compound grind called the abyss uh that is currently being prototyped okay. it's taking forever to be prototyped uh there was a lot of things that kind of need to be worked on and i appreciate everyone's patience that's one of the photos that i've shared that's a 2d version on my Instagram that people really, really liked. And uh, I, I hopefully I will get them in the next month or so. Uh, and I'm looking forward to opening the pre-order for those because I think people are really excited about it. But it's a compound. It's it's a Bowie with a compound grind, more of a Japanese style, but it has a fuller. It's going to have a lot of really fun things to the blade it's just very pleasing to the eye and very utilitarian uh, i'm a huge fan of bowies i know you are too yeah, right yeah I uh, am. so so i i'm very excited I, i've had the opportunity to show it to a, a good number of friends in knife design and knife making and really, really stoked on it the thing that i'm pretty stoked about and i know this doesn't really have anything to do with knives but um i uh 
I'm currently, I have prototypes for this, which is a pry bar um, and that, a multi-tool. So that is really sweet. excited. Yeah, thanks. Really excited about it. So it's a multi-tool. When you kind of take a look on the sides, you see that it houses, um, magnetically houses uh, bits. So you can kind of push them up through the body and then stick it on like that. Um, it was called, <laughs> I put out a poll thinking like, hey, what do you guys want to call this? And the internet advised that it should be called the space bar. <laughs> yeah. And it, it looks like a spaceship to me. I mean, like I could uh, play with yeah, that. All yeah, there. yeah. Yeah. It's super fun. And I was like, well, you know, maybe not. But like once you give, once you ask the internet for anything, they will <laughs> go, uh, do the most ridiculous. So really excited about this. This is kind of the only prototype currently that I have in my hand of something that's new. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, super excited about those. And we'll see how that goes. But it's been a lot of fun yeah, diving into new, new markets and new realms of new designs. And gosh, again, I cannot be... Um, more grateful for this community and getting to talk to really rad people like you and meeting people at blade show and uh dude it's just the best is yet to come and i truly truly believe that uh so yeah no oh, I, I i think most people would agree um and and the uh by the way the space bar or whatever your pry tool is going to be called if it's not the space bar is <laughs> yeah, very very knife adjacent i mean like you said it has nothing yeah. to do with knives that I, I don't know who likes pry bars more than knife knife guys and gals i think that is awesome and yeah. uh, so let it let people know how they can get in touch with you how they can get a, a pry bar or, or a, a yeah. space bar a crawler a necronaut or an antimatter yeah yeah so um uh the best way to reach me uh is through my instagram it's uh arcane design co arcane underscore design underscore co and uh, or my website arcadedesign.co. Uh, I have I, I launch all of my pre-orders there. So, for example, uh, the pre-order for the Necronaut version twos are up there, which is this knife, which is my first knife design. But I added thumb studs and did a couple of different other um, other things to it. And you can kind of check out all the information on there. Uh, I have a couple of antimatters in stock and I do periodic drops. Um, but the best way to kind of find out truly what's happening with Arcane Design is by going to the website and signing up for my newsletter. Um, I hate, personally, I hate signing up for newsletters because you're like, do this, they're going to send me like an email every morning and I don't care about anything <laughs> that they do and stuff like that. I swear. I have to manually send them. So I'm not going to send you an email every morning because I don't have the time. But I, when I do send emails, it truly is for the next drop or the next pre-order or special deals or what's happening with the, the prototyping process. And it's, I really try to make it engaging and something that people actually want to follow and learn more about uh, Arcane Design. So um, those are the best ways to do that. And uh yeah, looking forward to interacting with new people all the time. So, yeah. Well, Israel, thanks for coming back on the Knife Junkie podcast. I look forward to the next time I see you and talk with you. Uh, I, I love what you're doing. I think it's imaginative, but I also know just from having it in hand, it's super quality and just totally unique design. So uh, thanks for coming on. It's always a pleasure, yeah. sir. Thank you so much, Bob. I hope I'm good. And Thank you. Got a question or comment? Call the Knife Junkies listener line at 724-466-4487. There he goes, Israel Bacchus of Arcane Design Company. Uh, check them out. Uh, check him out on Instagram. He's got an, a great feed. Like I said, uh, you not only get a chance to see the work that he's doing, the knives, uh, but you also get a kind of view into his mind and what goes into designing them just in the way he sets the whole thing up. Uh, I am looking forward to, this is actually, I gotta be 100% honest, probably the first or maybe the second pry bar that actually interests and excites me. Um, so I, I'm, I'm gonna keep my eye out for that. Uh, 
check in with us next Sunday for another interview show. And of course, every Wednesday for the midweek supplemental where I show off knives from my personal collection, such as this antimatter. I've been joyfully showing off. Also check out Thursday Night Knives live 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, every week and uh, join us. You can actually come on the show just by going to thenifejunkie.com slash join, putting a little light on your face, putting in your earbuds and aiming your phone right at you. And uh, we'll get to meet and talk and just go on and on all night or at least for two hours about knives. So until then, uh, for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.